Last week we saw Israel murdering innocent people taking humanitarian aid to Gaza. When I was there, I felt like I was in a weird horror movie, like Pirates of the Mediterranean, with Israel playing a central role. Bullets flying everywhere, people being shot, people being killed. It was one of those horrific experiences that many of us on the Mavi Mavama will experience in our lives. And the worst thing was knowing, as we were sitting with our hands bound in the prisons, that Israel was trying to stop the world from knowing the truth. It had confiscated our cameras, our phones, our satellite links to outside world. Israel was trying to silence us. But what we were reliant on were people like you, to get the truth out, to expose the lies coming out from Israel, and to get justice for those who had been murdered. Israel thought it could get away with massacring people on the Mavi Marama because it had massacred hundreds and thousands of Palestinians. Israel thought it could get away with imprisoning us because it is imprisoning 11,000 Palestinian political prisoners as we speak. Enough is enough. I know all of you will be going back to your communities, your families and your friends with a commitment to build a movement because what we need now is to seize the moment, seize this time. People need to expose Israel for what it really is. See the apartheid nature of Israel. We have a duty to end the siege on Gaza, to end Israel's occupation and to a free Palestine. We have a duty never to forget those who have given their lives for, the Palestinian, for Palestinian freedom. Not those on the Mavi Mamama, but all those Palestinians who have given their lives over the decades for free Palestine. So, join PSC, join Be The Palestina, join all the movements so we can work together. Because united, we can make a difference. We can affect change, we can force our governments to listen, and we can force Israel to abide by international law. We cannot stop. We must send a message to, the, to Israel that they didn't just attack seven odd hundred people on a ship, they attacked millions of us. Let's stand together, united, undivided, let's organise, let's mobilise to end the siege in Gaza, end Israeli occupation, and for a free Palestine. Thank you. I'm going to start by giving some of the, uh, an account of some of the things I've seen, uh, some that's already been uh, printed in the press, others that I've reported on for Al Jazeera, um, but also some things that are yet uh, to be disclosed. And then hopefully maybe uh, try and explain some of the wider political ramifications of um, the bloodshed uh, that was the Israeli attack on the Mavi Marmara uh, last week. Um, I was on board the ship um, actually professionally as a, as, a, as a journalist, I was there to report what happened, but um, as with most cases, uh, the Israeli government and the Israeli military does not differentiate between anyone. Um, it lacks anyone who uh, opposes or disagrees with its barbaric methods and policies um, and treats them all uh, with sheer and utter contempt, to put it politely. Um, when I first joined the ship, I was given access to every single centimeter of that ship by the organizers. I was allowed to film every single centimeter of that ship. Um, this was in Istanbul, then in Antalya, and then again less than 24 hours before commandos descended upon that ship in the middle of the night, killing uh, several people and wounding dozens. I checked every single centimeter of that ship and I filmed every single centimeter of that ship. There was not one weapon on board that ship. There was not one gun, there was not one, uh, any, any artillery that you could consider to be lethal, there was none of that on board the ship. In fact, less than 24 hours before the attack, I, we broadcasted a, my reports on Al Jazeera English, which showed the most lethal thing that was on board that ship were fruits and vegetables, if you could consider them. Aside from that, there was nothing. It was very evident that Israel was going to prevent this ship or try and prevent this ship um, uh, and use this as an excuse. So it was something that I tried to highlight. Despite the fact that everyone on board the ship had expected some sort of standoff or a confrontation, no one wanted one. Um, and most of all, no one expected it to take place or to happen in the uh, bloody and inhumane nature that it ended up unfolding in. 
On the day that the attack happened, at roughly 11 p.m. local time, which was roughly 8 p.m. GMT, um, was when we first spotted Israeli naval ships from afar. We could see on either side uh, at least two huge warships, um, oh, and that number then increased. And we could also see what later on we discovered to be helicopters also in the sky. So the organizers of the ship had requested for most passengers to remain below deck, um, and it was only mainly the journalists and um, the leading activists who were above deck. Uh, as a journalist, I started reporting on the presence of these ships. Um, this went on for roughly up until 2 a.m. local time. Um, at roughly 1.30 a.m., 2 a.m. local time, the organizers informed me that they had in fact rerouted the ship because they did not want a confrontation by night. They said they were going further away from Israel and deeper into international water. Um, this is not the action of uh, someone that would want a confrontation or that would want to kill other people. So I had sent an email to my news desk saying that this indeed was the case. I was going to try and get a couple of hours rest and hopefully not to expect anything until the morning. Um, roughly just after 4 a.m., uh, the attack started. Um, I ran up quickly to the top deck. I was, for those of you who saw the report, I was still actually wearing my pajamas under my life jacket. Um, and uh, that's when we saw the Israeli commandos literally swarming across from every angle of the ship. There was two helicopters, maybe not, not higher than, than this ceiling above us. Um, one of them, that was directly above where the cameras were, where we were filming as journalists, kept trying to ram into the satellite dish. Um, I called out the satellite phone I had to call the news desk. It wasn't working. No one's phones were working. These are satellite phones that practically work anywhere in the world. None of these phones were working. We later found out that also those who were inside the media room downstairs trying to email, the email was also jammed. So one of these helicopters kept trying to jam. Um, as far as I knew, the camera was working and the microphone was working, so, so I did what I, what, what, you know, what I thought was best and tried to, to, to portray it. After I filed my first report, right behind me, if you, imagine, if you imagine the ship has two corridors on either side, so most of the fighting was taking place at the front, or most of the attack on the top deck was taking place at the front side of the corridor where I was standing at the rear of. After I filed my first report, I turned around to see. And what I saw right after I filed that first report was one of the Turkish passengers um, was shot the top of his head from a helicopter. And he died almost instantly. There was no soldier on board the ship when he was killed. There was not one soldier on board the ship when the first person that I saw killed was killed. Um, after he was killed, a second person was also killed. Throughout this time there were wounded people that came um, and the wounded that were came were taken downstairs. Um, after we, uh, two people had been killed, or after I had seen two people that had been killed, um, the organizer, uh, the main uh, leader of the Turkish uh, contingency, Holland, uh, took off his white t-shirt or, or top uh, and gave it to one of the activists to wave a white flag. This activist stood a few meters behind me waving the flag. Live fire was still fired after that white flag. Live fire was still fired. There was an announcement made by one of the uh, passengers in English and Hebrew uh, saying that the ship has been surrendered. Live fire was still fired after that announcement as well. Um, after we went down, uh, myself, uh, Ismail Patel from uh, Friends of Al-Aqsa, also a British citizen, and the Turkish cameramen were the last three to leave the top deck. Um, after we had gone down, uh, the scene inside the room where everyone was gathered was um, it's very understood. You cannot describe what there was. Ultimately, the, I mean, shock, horror, blood, uh, every, 
every possible negative emotion that you can think of and every possible bad feeling that you would not wish upon your worst enemy filled that room. Uh, there was blood on the floor. Um, at the front where the reception area was, there were three very critically injured people. Now those three critically injured people, um, the doctors were trying as hard as they could and there were so many of them that really, really they tried as hard as they could to save their lives. Um, the Israeli member of the Knesset, uh, Hanin Zobi, she uh, announced her and, a, and an activist called Lubna, who also speak, spoke Hebrew, they announced in English, Arabic and Hebrew on the Tannoy that there are three critically injured people. Uh, please come and take them. No one is armed. We have surrendered. Please come and take these three people. This announcement was made at least, at least eight times. No one came. Afterwards, the tannoy that was being used was cut off in work. So uh, Hanin, the, the member of uh, the Knesset, she wrote on the back of a cardboard box in Hebrew the exact same message. She took this message with a, in one hand and a white flag in another hand. She walked up to the windows where the Israeli soldiers had now come on deck but had been standing surrounded the room from the outside. As she approached the window, the laser-guided uh, automatic weapons that they had were directed to her forehead. And she was ushered with it to move away. She left. After that, one of the three people died. Um, this caused even more uh, despair amongst the passengers and, 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 and So a British citizen also she tried to do the same thing, this time holding a Union Jack and going to another set of soldiers. She was met with exactly the same response. All in all, these three critically injured people died, the first maybe after an hour and a half of the Israeli soldiers um, uh, being surrounding the room and everyone surrendering, all three of them died within three hours of, of, of them there. All three of these people could have been saved. All these three of these people were killed twice. Once by those who shot them, and secondly by those who refused to, aid, to, to come to their aid. This is not the action of an army which claims to abide by international law. This is not uh, the action of an army who our country should supply with weapons. Now, after these people had been killed, uh, there were still uh, the other room. Most of the passengers were gathered in one room, and the other room had most of the injured people. They were numbered in the dozens. There was also those who had internal bleeding. One of the men was shot in both of his legs. Uh, there was severe loss of blood. We didn't have any blood transfusion uh, um, machines or anything, so there was no way of, of trying to, to keep these people alive as, as much as possible. So uh, Sarah and Hanin managed to negotiate for some of the injured to be taken. But some of the Turkish uh, people who were injured, and rightly so, were too frightened to go with the Israelis because they had just seen injured people neglected and left to die in cold blood, and therefore they, they didn't trust that they would be taken care of. Um, and God only knows how much the fact that they, haven't be, they hadn't been treated right away, how much that will affect them in the future. Um, following this, uh, myself and Sama and uh, Hanin uh, tried to gather everyone into one room um, and leave the injured with the doctors in another because they started to arrest people. We weren't sure where they were taking people because we kept hearing helicopters coming and going. Um, it later turns out we transpired that they were just taking us to the deck above. However, we weren't sure and uh, the worst thing to do at that point was to be divided. So everyone agreed to remain in one room together. Um, one of them, as they started taking the injured people, and we wanted to take them, one of them who had an internal bleeding and couldn't be lifted on anything other than a stretcher, they refused to give us a stretcher. Um, we asked several times, in fact, the response was, use a sleeping bag. Um, ultimately, this person was taken on a, I think, on, on the back of a door or some sort of, Carry it, so very heavy. On, a, on a blanket even. Um, again, his fate, God only knows. Um, 
once uh, everyone had moved to the other room, uh, Sam has stayed with the injured, and, and I'll let him talk about that. Um, the room I remained in, uh, I remained at the back to make sure that everyone had been, I thought as a journalist I would be given some sort of uh, uh, immunity, so I, I wanted to use that to ensure that everyone was, was left first together. This obviously means nothing to the idea of freedom of speech and, and press freedom is, is relevant or probably non-existent in Israel. Um, what happened was uh, one or two women uh, wanted to go to the bathroom whilst the Israelis had now gone into the other room. So, uh, so I stood at the door waiting for them to come out. As they came out, the soldier demanded that they come to, her, to, to him. I advised them not to come and to come back to the room, so one of them did, unfortunately. The other, um, out of fear, was, was frozen where she was. So that forced me to come up next to her, at which point I was cuffed, thrown to the ground, kicked, uh, my hands tied behind my back, uh, with no more than, not even a millimeter space between them. Um, I was then taken outside onto the deck where, again, I was pushed, my, my face slammed against the wall, uh, my possessions taken off me, and then taken upstairs where I saw that all the other passengers had gathered. We sat on the deck, uh, by this time it's morning, the sun's out, we sat on the deck under the, 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 the heat of the sun, uh, on our knees with our hands tied behind our back, not able to move for, for what seemed like hours. Uh, I had requested to go to the bathroom. Uh, I wasn't allowed for at least three hours, if not four. The only reason why I was allowed was, again, some of the story what happened there, but the, the, one of the superiors of the, he was probably, I think he was the only unmasked person who came down from the army, uh, and he allowed me to go, but I, when I went, I went with my hands tied behind my back um, there as well. Um, after that, after that, we were then taken downstairs, and what had obviously happened is whilst we were upstairs, they ransacked everything downstairs. There is, uh, literally, if you imagine the aftermath of an earthquake, is what the scene was downstairs. Everyone's belongings thrown around everywhere. Um, there were, they had used dogs. Um, there was obviously plenty of uh, uh, Quran copies and also the Bible and many other holy books that were present. These were just trashed around. There was no regard for anything sacred whatsoever, um, least of all for human life and dignity. Um, we remained downstairs. By this time, it was uh, early afternoon. Uh, we arrived in Ashdod at about 6, 7 p.m. Um, I was only taken off the ship at 7 or 8 a.m. the next day. Throughout this time, uh, I did not eat anything, there was no food, uh, literally all that was given to me were three sips of water, um, and that's it. Uh, during that time I saw one of the passengers sitting next to me, who was an elderly Palestinian man from Gaza, who was actually only on board this ship because he could not get back to Gaza any other way. The Egyptians had refused him entry, he couldn't get back through Israel, so he, was, he had only left Gaza to seek treatment, his wife had cancer and he, he was a diabetic. He was only this sh on the ship to return. So he was a diabetic, he was refused toilet and, uh, to go to the toilet, and he, he was in his, at least his 50s. He ended up urinating on himself. Um, there was one of the, the Malaysian uh, activists on the top deck earlier in the day. His hands were tied so tight behind his back, I could see it going all sorts of colors. He requested once, twice, three times, very politely, very soft spoken. Can you please uh, loosen this? The Israeli uh, soldier came up to him after the third time, <coughs> tightened it even more. Um, the scream that he let out um, from a grown man who, who really, and it's just, it was very, very difficult to accept because you, you are there also, you don't know, you know, you, you feel helpless <coughs> as well to, to, to try and do something. Um, when we were taken off the ship at Ashdod, um, I was asked to sign a deportation order. No, the first thing that was told to me by the Israeli uh, soldier on, on the other side of this small bridge that took us off the, or ramp rather, that took us off the ship, said, welcome to Israel, are you enjoying your time? Um, I honestly said to him, I've had better times. Um, he, uh, 
they asked me to sign a deportation order. My hands are still cuffed. This is more than 24 hours after. They asked me to sign a deportation order which stated I had entered Israel illegally and agreed to be deported within 72 hours. So I said, um, with all due respect, I haven't entered Israel, uh, legally or illegally, you've taken me here. Um, and on this point, I also want to raise something that's very important for us here, for the media, for anyone who's relaying what took place or, or even speaking about it. None of the activists were detained. None of the people were detained. We were all kidnapped. Detention, uh, there is a legal uh, justification for it. No one was detained, no one was arrested. Every single person was kidnapped, abducted, full stop. There's no, there's no other way to describe this. So I said, I, I did not enter Israel, you've brought me here, uh, and therefore I find it impossible for me to sign this. They said, well, do you want to go to jail? I said, I did, no, but I'm not going to sign this. Um, in which case, at which point my passport was taken off me, um, I was given what they claimed was a medical test, but really was nothing more than someone checking my heartbeat and ticking, asking me to tick boxes about asthma and whatnot. I had ticked the, the asthmatic box, and because I didn't have my inhaler with me, I, I thought I would be given one. I was only given one uh, at 11 p.m. that evening by the prison guard after, after uh, requesting it for several hours. Um, we were then uh, uh, grouped together and divided into buses that took us to the Beersheba prison. Um, I was taken away from all the other journalists. I was put into a group with the Algerian parliamentarians, the leader of the IHH, the Turkish uh, organization, Holland, uh, and uh, most of the, or, or a large amount of the Turkish uh, activists. In that time, um, we arrived at, uh, after, so we, Ashford was about 7, 8 a.m. By the time we got to Beersheba prison was 9 a.m., uh, 10 a.m. max. Um, it was only after I did the medical that my hands were untied. Um, so, so that was more than 24 hours. Um, in the prison, uh, I asked to see a lawyer. I was refused. I asked to see the British consulate. I was refused. I asked to make a phone call. I was refused. Uh, we were given some clothes and put into cells of, in groups of four and two, automatically. We, put, we were put into the cells, the cells were locked. Um, maybe that was probably the, the most difficult time because you are unaware what the world knows about you. Um, bearing in mind we hadn't eaten for over 24 hours, um, you're extremely drained, you haven't slept, um, and now you're in a, in a, maybe it was like, 15 foot by, by 9, 10 foot of cell. But people also, at the end of the days, as much as uh, there, is, there is solidarity between everyone, but there are people you don't know. My, uh, the, the people that were with me didn't speak English or Arabic, I didn't speak Turkish, and you're not sure exactly what's going to happen. Um, we, we remained locked in, those, uh, in the cells for a few hours, and then we were released, uh, or the, the doors were released yes. open for us to come out. Uh, there was a meal that was served. Uh, the meal that was served, uh, firstly, didn't, uh, uh, it wasn't enough for the people that were there. So I'm not even sure what it was. I just remember that people ate at that point. Um, a group of us, maybe six, seven, eight, nine of us, there wasn't any food. Um, I had asked again for the British consulate. I had asked again for a lawyer, and again, this was refused. Um, in the early afternoon, uh, a couple of Palestinian lawyers came in, uh, uh, Palestinian Israeli lawyers came in from Al Damir, uh, based in Ramallah, and uh, another of the, uh, the, the Palestinian prisoners' club. Uh, they took some accounts, um, and it was only through them that I managed to, for the first time to, to send a, uh, uh, some sort of message to my family. But again, I had never met them, I wasn't sure whether these were real lawyers or not, and don't know at that point. Um, In the evening, uh, again, I asked, and at this point, all the consulates had come. Macedonia had come, France had come, uh, the US had come, um, Jordan had come, Egypt had come. Every single consulate had come except the British. Um, I asked several times, uh, they, were, they said uh, they'll be coming, they never came. Uh, in the evening, uh, we went back into the cells. Um, 
at which point uh, we changed cells because the Jordanians had taken some people uh, away, some of the other nationalities had left, so the numbers became less. I, I was then in another cell with, uh, with uh, three Turkish uh, activists, two of whom spoke Arabic, so I managed to communicate with them. Um, we took it in turns to stay awake, to it because what was happening was every so often they would come and take one person away from their cell. So we took in turns to stay awake to keep a record of uh, the people that were going missing. Um, at 3 a.m. Uh, I was awake, uh, the guard came in, started banging, he said all the, he called for all the Turkish nationals. He put down a box with the passports, he said, you're going. The Turkish organizers refused to leave. They said, we will not be leaving until every single other nationality that leaves. They defended British citizens and ultimately for the Turkish government and what it did, I firmly believe I would still be behind bars now. They refused to leave until everyone left. So the, so, so, so the next morning uh, is when they rounded us up. In the morning, the intelligence service, I'm not sure whether it was the Shabak or the Mossad, tried to question me. I refused to answer without a consular. They kept trying. The point, to summarize, I was released uh, finally because of the Turkish government. Throughout my time, I did not see a British official. Throughout my time, I did not see a lawyer. Throughout my time, I did not make a phone call during that. When I, we got to the prison, when we got to Ben Gurion Airport, they said to me, "I said, where is my passport?" They gave me a paper that had a picture of me and some Hebrew and my passport number. They said to me, "Congratulations, this is your new passport." I said, "Where is my passport?" Um, he said to me, "Sue me." Was the response. To this point, I still don't have my passport. It's in uh, custody uh, of the Israeli government. Yesterday, I went to the foreign office. They said to me today that they had requested it from uh, the Israeli ambassador here. This is only less than three months since Israel has used passports for illegal murder of uh, citizens in a sovereign country. And it's just a slap in the face to Britain who claims to have a special relationship with Israel, yet its uh, uh, um, citizens are treated with the most utmost disregard and uh, complete disrespect. Um, just, very quickly, just very quickly to sum up here, and this is the most important thing I think in terms of um, the political action that must be taken from now on and, um, and what people must work on. The Israelis, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, could not have operated in any worse way had they actually allowed this flotilla in most of the press and media would not have even heard or reported about it. What they did actually was an, uh, a service to the cause because it showed them once again the complete disregard they have for international law, for every single uh, decent uh, moral uh, value that people hold. What must continue from this is that people in Gaza do not, are, are not left forsaken just because what we went through ultimately it's not, it's not even 48 hours of what tens of thousands of Palestinians have gone through and go through year after year. As daunting as it may have been for me or for anyone else, ultimately there are tens of thousands of other Palestinians who go through this all the time and are unreported and people do not hear about. They do not have the luxury of coming here to speak or know the support that people have. The only thing that will keep them going and the only thing that they can live on is for more of these convoys to go through, for more journalists to go on the program. Um, and to wrap up, I just, I would like a, a, a request, uh, and I hope this isn't taken in the wrong way, this is more to do with the idea of British sovereignty and the property of our country, for people to contact their member of parliament and inform them that as it stands now, there is a British passport in Israeli custody. As it stands now, Israel has shows complete disregard to international law and to Britain, and this passport must be returned. Thank you.